Hi everybody, we're out here at the Japanese Friendship Garden in Phoenix and we're gonna go on a private tour with um, some people here, Ben and Reiko of the garden and they're gonna point out some features of the garden that might not be as obvious for first time visitors or people who um, don't know that much about Japanese gardens. Last week we were out here and we kind of did a tour, a silent tour of the garden, but this time um, they're gonna really be pointing out some really special features that make this garden so beautiful and special. And um, yeah, so come along with us. We're gonna learn some stuff and uh, have a nice peaceful time in the garden. Well, hey, this is Ben. I'm the curator here at the Japanese Friendship Garden, and welcome back to the garden, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna talk a couple, talk about a couple of the features here at the entrance that are um, unique to Japanese gardens. Um, so, the an informal style of pathway that we use quite a bit in Japanese garden um, is is called tobi ishi, which which basically means stepping stones and they're not just randomly randomly thrown in there. These are big heavy stones and the way that we figure out how we're going to place these is according to to someone's gait. So most people step forward with their right foot to begin with like so and this follows that sort of a of a pattern. So as I walk it follows what would be my natural gait. This is called a viewing stone, which is here so that people can, can look at the donor stone as well as the names that are on it with our supporters. And over here we have a fence, right? That's pretty special. Correct. And so this fence, we, we recently had a North American Japanese Garden Association workshop here, and this is one of the projects that we did for, for the workshop. And this is called a Kanenjigaki fence. And this is a style of fence used uh, at a temple in Kyoto that is called Kenenji. And so in building this fence, we first built an interior frame. And then after that, we took uh, pieces of bamboo of different sizes, which we split and then attached to, to the interior frame. And then we used larger pieces of bamboo, which we broke into pieces of three instead of slats which then we tie on with a special, a special knot. Uh, this is called an otoko musubi, is this style of knot that we use on many of the, of the fences in, in Japanese gardens. Uh, the post, as you can see at the bottom there, the post is attached to a stone. Uh, which, so we drill through the stone and then we have a threaded rod that runs up until the post, which we attach to the stone and then the rod goes into the ground with a concrete footing. Uh, we want to get um, a number of years, this is a fairly intense fence to build, so we would like to get a number of years out of this fence, which is why we, why we built it the way we did. And then on the back side of the fence here, we did another style of fence, uh, which is similar in the trim that we used, and of course the knots, uh, but this style is called a brushwood fence. And this is all at the entrance of the garden. So it's like the first thing that you see when you come in. And then um, after that is when you really enter the garden area. And the first thing you see obviously is this huge um, pond or lake and um, this, this lantern. What is this about? Yeah, and so we have several different lanterns throughout the garden. This is our, our largest lantern and sort of most iconic, I suppose, um, that overlooks the lake here. And this is called a Kasaga lantern. And do you ever light them or do they always just we stay kind of like this? We certainly do, um, uh, particularly for events. Um, we do a couple of, well, we do a lot of different events. We do a spring and fall festival, which are probably our largest events. Which we, which we light up all the lanterns in the garden as well. Um, behind us here, we have what's called a Yunoki lantern, uh, which is in front of the restaurant. And 
and that's a cute little lantern. It's in front of, it's, um, I don't know if people can see it. I'll get closer. Um, there's like a little uh, fountain or, yeah, like a fountain in it. Is there any special meaning for that? So this is called Yunoki Lantern. Mm -hmm. Yunoki means the citrus tree. So this was found under the citrus tree called Yuzu. And then this lantern is originally from Korea. Okay, cool. So if you're just joining us, we're out here at the Japanese Friendship Garden of Phoenix. Everything is in bloom. It's so beautiful for spring. Unfortunately, the garden is not open to the public right now, but Ben is um, the curator here and he's here making sure that everything is being taken care of and stays really beautiful for when they do reopen so you guys can come and enjoy the garden as well. And um, so we're moving past kind of the front part of the garden and we're going over the bridge where all the boys are and they're like hungry. They are ready for breakfast. <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> and so you mentioned the bridges. So the first bridge that we crossed over, um, which is that one, uh, is called a Taiko Bashi Bridge. And the name Taiko is like like the taiko drums and so that shape is similar uh, to the, the top of a drum. Cool. And then the the bridge we're currently crossing is called a Yatsuhashi or zigzag bridge and this is a really um, iconic element of, of Japanese gardens as well. You'll find this style of bridge in, in many different Japanese gardens throughout the country and Japan of course. So the style of, of pruning that we see in these shrubs here, um, we have a single one here underneath the pine, and then we have the groups of, of the pruned shrubs over here. And so one is called a tamamono, which just translates to round thing, uh, really, really complex. And then uh, a grouping of them is called katakomi. And <clears throat> the, the plant material that we use here is uh, a, a form of dwarf myrtle, which has a really small leaf and makes for an excellent texture for, for pruning in this style. And as you guys can see, there's another lantern sitting in the middle of the lake over here. Very cool. Yes, and that is a Yukimi lantern, or it translates to, to snow viewing lantern. And when that is lit above the, the lake, and particularly at night, it makes for a pretty, pretty spectacular view. Uh, the pine that you see uh, here that's kind of jutting out on that small peninsula there is um, it's an Aleppo pine which is what most of our sculpted pines in the garden are and that particular tree is is uh, the mayor's tree and so uh, all of the mayors that have uh, of both Himeji our sister city as well as Phoenix um, have their have their names inscribed on that stone So here's a better view of that pine, a little more, um, a closer view. And then there's this bird that's yeah. been sitting here for a while. Yeah, so they're called cormorants and uh, they're, they're water birds. So they, they've got webbed feet and they, they swim in the pond and catch um, some of the smaller fish uh, to eat. And it's also, yeah. 
a bird okay, that's okay. yeah that's yeah, common so, in Japan. Yeah, it's the uh, traditional method of catching fish historically in Japan. So these birds were used to um, so the, the person who handle bird handler he probably have five or six birds in his uh, on the strings, and then they go hunt the fish for the fishermen. But yeah. they are not able to swallow it because they have that rope tied around the neck. So, and they do bring the fish back to the fishermen and they, they spit the fish out. And that's the uh, old method of catching fish, that those birds are used for those. So, so the nice myth is they meals, help them, you know? yeah, they catch fish and then they help fishermen because they can't swallow. Right, right. because of the rope is tied around their neck. Yeah. And yeah, so they spit out the fish, then they come back to the boat. And then fisherman was able to collect all those fish. Cool, very cool. And so this part of, of the garden we call, one term for it is the harbor that we refer to it as. And as you can see, there's more, more Tobiishi stones here like we have. You can see there's the plaque for the for the mayor's tree with all of the past and including our our current mayor uh, mayor gallego who we look forward to to showing the garden as, as soon as we can And this bird is not, we're pretty close to it. It's not afraid of us. Indeed. I think he's gotten used to, uh, to people being in the garden around him. It's a, it's a peaceful place for the birds as well. He's very happy to live here. <laughs> and so these stones are the, the water version of the Tobiishi. These are called Sawatari. And it's the same same concept of the sort of informal stroll uh, type gate um, to get across the water. Mr. Okita as well. I like how he, he put the splash stone beneath the waterfall there to, that catches the water in, uh, in the middle of the cascade. Yeah, it's a really good visual of the water. And then it there's a big waterfall is. over there. He's one of the best garden designers in the world. could mention a, a fence uh, here briefly as well. So this is a, a different style of fence that you traditionally find around a, a tea garden in, in Japan. And this is called a Yotsumagaki fence. But as you can see, I use the same style of knot here as I did on, on the Kanenjigaki fence in the front.
and these areas that are beautiful. You know, it's like a waterfall. Falls up. Offer weddings and several occasional events here, and this is a very popular spot for people want to get married in front of this beautiful waterfall. Yeah, it's very romantic. Very romantic. <laughs> spot, yes. so over here, um, this is called a shachi, and shachi is from Himeji, Japan. That's our sister city. And this has face of tiger and a body of fish. It's a mythical creature. And this fish sits on top of the Himeji castle. It's a sister city castle. It's a 500 year old castle. And people believe that by placing this mythical creature on top of the castle, believe it's a, it's a protection from the fire. People believe that when castle caught fire, it, before they believe the water comes out from his mouth to put the, put the fire out and we adapted this image as our uh, logo for the garden and there are several of these placed around the garden yes. right yeah. there's one at the front gate as well so they're gardening He's guarding our garden. So we have a, a sister garden as well of a, as a sister city. It's called Kokoen in, in Himeji in Japan. And one of my favorite parts about that garden is with, with their large waterfall, they have plant material that's surrounding uh, their waterfall and so that's one of the planting schemes that I'm introducing here and so we've got some red buds and I'm even trying a couple of, of Japanese maples which it's it's likely too hot for but I'm hoping that with the microclimate of the water next to it uh, we might get them to to survive and do these pines they do okay in the heat right they certainly do they do in fact, sometimes I wish they wouldn't grow so fast. Um, you know, these are these are Aleppo pines, and, and they really thrive here. Uh, there is a, a blight that has um, attacked some of the Aleppo, larger Aleppo pines in the valley. We have not had uh, any of that here. Uh, I certainly do whatever I can to maintain excellent health of these trees because the best defense for that kind of thing is is an overall healthy tree. So they have a rigorous fertilization and pruning program that, that I stick to. There's some beautiful irises in bloom. Just in time for Easter. Yes, they're they're spectacular this year. We have a, a volunteer who works extremely hard to maintain the health and, and vigor of, of these these irises. One of my favorite parts of this garden as well is, is or, or exciting features is that we have several different areas that feel like entirely different worlds. And so um, this is what we refer to as, as the mountain area. Um, and in here you'll find, um, for the most part, different plant material than we find in the rest of the garden, um, including pittosporum, viburnums, uh, we have some camellia in here, 
We actually, we have three different kinds of, of viburnum in, in this part of the garden. And it's considerably cooler. Like, it as soon as is. you enter this part, the temperature drops. It's amazing. And this is where I will be working over the summer. <laughs> Here you can see this beautiful tower. It's called uh, Tasoto, uh, which means many layers, of many layers tower. And this is originally from India. It's a Buddhist-driven uh, structure. And uh, in the past, Buddhist monks kept their um, okyo, the relics, in in between those uh, layers. So they were used as a storage. Uh, type of uh, stat, uh, item also uh, we use it as a it's also ornamental tower now So if you look to the right here, um, so there's there's different types of stonework that goes into to Japanese gardens, and um, this shoreline that we're looking at across the water there is is a good example of um, one type called gogan ishi, which is like staggered up and down, and then also in and out. So you won't see, you know, stones at the same level all in a line in a Japanese style garden. Um, but rather more like you would see stones that are in nature, arranged around the water. Another one of the plants that I've been happy with so far is, is the ground cover that we're using in, in this, some of the sunnier locations in the garden. And people perhaps are, are familiar with uh, frog fruit or Lipia nataflora, uh, which has been around for quite some time. However, that particular plant can be pretty invasive. Um, this is a new um, and sterile improved version of that plant, um, which does not so sterile means it doesn't put off viable seeds, so it won't blow all over the place and come up where you don't want it to. Um, but this is what we use as a substitution for moss that we would have in Japan. Um, moss, you know, we, if we get a few square feet of moss, and we're, we're quite happy with that. Uh, so this is what, what fits the bill for us, so to speak, in terms of a dark green ground cover. And it holds up in the heat extremely well. It also uses about 60 or 70 percent less water than, than turf or grass. A good alternative for sure. You can see the pines here are, are pushing up their, their new growth, so we refer to those as candles. and. We do a heavy pruning in the fall, and then at this time of year, what I will do is go around and reduce and thin out um, most of those candles so that we keep the, the profile and shape of the tree um, tight. Um, <clears throat> and then we will do another pruning uh, involving cutting more woody growth in the fall. So we've done um, a lap around the garden and we're back at the entrance and 
this is actually the restroom, but it's a, it's an important building as well. Yes, it is. Um, so this particular architectural style is called the Sukiya, and uh, we invited a um, special carpenter came from Japan to put these buildings together, and he used a very special technique that uh, not many people possess. Uh, even in Japan, so it was quite a um, great learning experience for me and it was very interesting. Um, so yeah, it's, it, we have so much pride in this building because it gives you feelings like you are really, feels like you're in Japan when you see this. Yeah, it's a very traditional um, looking building and it blends really well into the garden. Yes. It's really beautiful. Very well. yeah. Well, thank you guys for joining us um, on this tour, this behind the scenes in depth tour of the Japanese Friendship Garden here in Phoenix. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. And as soon as they reopen, come down and enjoy it for yourself. It's really beautiful in person. And if you're needing some of the content from here, you can always go to their um, social media channels and get content about the garden in the meantime. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys. Thank you.